In this video, we will take a look at the most common coordinate systems used in the course. We will focus on the Cartesian and polar coordinate systems. We will explain how to define the positive and negative directions of such systems and talk about some of their characteristics. At the end of the video, we expect you to recognize these systems and know what the minimum requirements are to create these systems. You will not regret this one. Let's start with the one most familiar to us, the Cartesian coordinate system. But better, let's take a step back and define what are the minimum components any coordinate system needs to have. This is kind of arbitrary, but it works. There are three elements that a coordinate system needs to be called a coordinated system and therefore be usable as such. These elements are an origin, axis on top of which we measure the desired magnitudes, and a clear definition of a positive and negative direction of these axes. Now that we have it clear, let's analyze the Cartesian and polar coordinate system under this class. For example, in the Cartesian coordinate system, which is one of the most familiar to us, we can easily identify these characteristics. The Cartesian system has a clear origin, from where you can say the axis grow in three specific directions, which happen to be perpendicular between them. Actually, the right term is orthogonal. We said grow, but you know that's not true. The axis pass through the origin, that is much more correct. Okay, we have origin and axis. Now to set the positive and negative direction, we need to use a rule. A law that allows to consistently define the positive and negative direction in the same way every time we employ a Cartesian coordinate system. If not, you got it. We will be comparing pairs with apples. For the Cartesian system, we often employ the right hand rule to set the positive and negative directions. This rule tells us that the positive axes follow the fingers of the hand and correspondingly, the negative axes follow the opposite direction. We cannot get something simpler than this. Now in the case of polar coordinate system, things are a little bit different. Polar coordinate systems can only represent points in two dimensions, where each point can be represented by a distance from a reference point and an angle from a reference direction. You'll see what I'm talking about. Let's verify the conditions. First, the polar coordinate system has also a clear origin. Second, the most surprising thing, as I just said, the polar coordinate system has just one axis, where a distance is represented. Aha! The fact that we have just one axis might indicate to us that this system could be easier to use, and this is true for some cases. Again, the axis grows from an origin point, but in this case, this free axis might grow oriented arbitrarily with respect to a reference direction. You see that this axis can stretch and rotate on a plane. And more amazingly, truly you don't need any other axis to define a variable in this system. Finally, the positive direction of this axis always points away from the origin for the case of the distance and also follows a right-hand rule to set the positive orientation. Let's do a small comparison between these two systems. If we wanted to describe the position of a point on a Cartesian coordinate system, we would need to know the value of the position of this point on all three rectangular axes. And I didn't say it, but it would be nice to give names to these axes. Of course, names that you might already know, x, y, and z. Then the position of a point is defined as how much I have to travel on each of these axes. Now in the polar coordinate system, the position of the same point is defined in a less intuitive way. We know that the vector growing from the origin must end in the point, but now how can we define the orientation and length of this vector? Well, easy. First, we rotate a vector contained in the reference plane until we aim at the point. This rotation is represented by an angle alpha. Then we take the tip of the vector and stretch it a certain magnitude, r, until it touches the point. Then to reference the point represented in the Cartesian coordinate system, we will use the notation x, y, z being 3, 6, 0. And to reference the same point in the polar coordinate system, it would be something like 4, 30 degrees. 
Notice that we assumed for this example that the Z component of the Cartesian coordinate system was zero to force it to be a two-dimensional representation of the point, so we could use the polar coordinate system for comparison purposes. It was not that difficult, right? Hopefully, this is the starting point to refresh that knowledge covered in dust. You will see that we will be using a lot of these two systems, and you'll become very familiar with them. So familiar that you won't even think about them anymore. Thank you for watching and we will meet you soon with another nice chapter.